Hello everyone, I'm Brian. Today I'm reacting to How to Be Spiritual from Jalakhani Hindu Academy. <clears throat> Link in the description. Okay, so I uh, was looking around a little bit and I found this. I'm going to do a few others, I think, with uh, Swami Saraprayananda and Sadhguru on how to be spiritual. So let's first watch Jalankani. Let's go ahead and get started. There's no CC. When we compare our prescription to go to that <clears throat> same destination, our prescriptions are different. Each and every one will have slightly different prescription. This, is, this really shows that we have different starting point in our religious journey. That's all it reflects. And what's the proof of the pudding? If I'm sincere in the way I want to promote or pro progress spiritually, I'm going in my direction, and she's sincere and she's progressing in that direction, and so is he. As we progress to our own destination using our own prescription, not his prescription, my own prescription, as we progress, do you know what happens? Like magic. As we go closer to the center, all of us, we feel tremendous affinity for each other. Even though we are using different prescriptions, we don't feel comp oh dear, uh, if I start following her prescription, I'll hit the wall. <laughs> I must carry on my way. And yet, as we move towards the, if you like, our destination, we are serious about our own progress. Forget about others. We want to progress. We feel natural affinity of, with people from other faiths also, because we seem to get closer to the center, we feel closer to each other as well. Mm, that should be true, honestly. Um, I, I mean, I wish faith-based religions would have that in mind. It's like they're all trying to seek God, even there are different gods, or whatever it may be. And again, that's the reason why I do like Hinduism, is the fact that, you know, each to their own way, each to their own paths, each to their own beliefs. <clears throat> because everyone's path is different. It's like you was talking about, about the prescription, how... I mean, it could be the same prescription, but different paths. All the, well, the prescription's the same. It's just you know, basically, it's well, the prescription. The, the the what they're getting at is the same, but the path is different. Everyone has a different path. So, and there are some religion out there who says all other religions are false. You must convert them and all that. Pretty crazy stuff. But yeah. I do believe everyone has their own path. There's n there are wrong paths, but is there wrong paths? No, probably not. There's probably not a wrong path. Well, maybe I'm, I have to think about that one. I think there. I mean, obviously, we can see some paths as being kind of wrong, but they may not be wrong. They're difficult paths or terrible paths to take. I'll have to think about that one. But generally speaking, so long as you're genuinely trying to find your path, it's good. it could be rough, it could be dangerous, it could be whatever. But everyone can learn a lesson in the path they take, and hopefully they arrive to the proper <laughs> destination. Some people may, may not get there in their lifetime, and but at least I hope they strive for the better path. Even though using different directions, and if we move away from the center, so we make a big hoo -ah, I'm the best, and this is it. I'm moving away from the center. I feel at this, you know, at, at loggerheads with people of other religion as well as people of my own religion. So the idea is rather the fight about which is the best prescription, follow your prescription to its destination. That's the whole idea of pluralism. And I think for this seminary, to absorb this idea, I think it's, it's if you like a very powerful, this is not a ploy. Please remember, this is not a ploy. This is reality. This is what I said. That exper at the experiential level, the prophets or the mystics did the same thing. But the moment they try and give expression, their own cultural background will kick in. So when Jesus goes into the, for into, into the wilderness and comes back a chained man, he says, I've seen and come to the Father in heaven. He's giving expression that suited his own time. When Buddha sits under the Bodhi tree and says, I'm enlightened, he's using a different language to give expression to the same. Ex this is the this thing that comes from Hinduism, pluralism, pluralism, many pathways of exploding spirit. It doesn't stop there. This is the conclusion of the Hindu religion, and this touches me. Like this is the part that I love the most. He says, this idea of polarizing and thinking about God as a super personality and trying to build a relationship with it is a very powerful tool for spiritual progress. The reason they say is this: think about it. 
You see, <coughs> there are certain endearing aspect to all of us. <coughs> like when I was asking the child, what do you mean by spirit? You said love and compassion. There are certain endearing aspect to all of our characters. Somehow compassion for our near and dear ones seems to be flow seems to flow naturally, and we seem to f find it very nice and very warm and very endearing. Similarly, this search for truth or trying to make sense of the world is also very natural for all living things, and we seem to think this is a very powerful thing that ex and expresses our, and our our real our real nature. So is the idea of being empowered. You see, this is this is the sign of a living thing. You cannot push it about. It is always not in conformity with physical force saying, push me about. It is in defiance of it. If you've got a single cell living thing and you prod it, it doesn't roll over saying, I'm dead. It goes, mm. <laughs> It goes, ouch, if nothing else. This is the sign of the spirit. It doesn't like to be pushed about. It likes to be empowered. And do you know what's the apex, the best example of how the spirit shows itself? We sitting here. Thousands of years ago, human beings were huddling in the caves, shivering, you know, starving, and the thunderbolts were falling. Ah, God sending messages and bowing down. And these same human beings, using the intellect, they recognize that we do not like to be pushed about by the forces of nature. We'll harness them, put, it them, put them in wires, and light up our rooms and heat them, heat the rooms up. This is the sign of the spirit. It doesn't like being pushed about. It masters nature doesn't allow nature to push it about. It becomes, shows its mastery over nature, spirit, becoming empowered. These are human enduring features in human beings, and we all recognize them as something that's very special about all living things, not only human, all living things. Now you see, what, what we have done unknowingly, or sometimes knowingly, is that we recognize these are very powerful things that we possess. So what we do is we exaggerate them. So we are a little knowing. Let me think about somebody who's all-knowing. I am little compassionate, let me project the idea of all compassion. I am little empowered, let me think of somebody who is fully all powerful. So I project this marvelous thing that I already within me, project them to the infinite, plonk it on one person, God you are that. You are all powerful, all loving, all compassionate, all knowing, oh Lord you are that. And the way I build relationship with you is I have to become like you, I have to reflect your qualities, I must be more compassionate. This is how I become religious, because I'm trying to build a relationship with this marvelous thing that I call God, and I must reflect his qualities. So the thing that is already trickling out from me, like compassion, I want to open up the taps so that it comes out in torrents. This is religious living. So you see, in this marvelous way, what is already within us, we are trying to seek somewhere outside. <coughs> that actually is quite true. There's a lot, I mean, uh, and that can be quite dangerous too. Again, if you look at extreme points, obviously you'll have people who, who truly, genuinely believe that they're talking to a god, <clears throat> their god, should I say? And because they're not quite right in the head, they think that their god wants them to cause harm. They think that I'm doing this in the name of God. But a lot of people tend to project themselves to God and justify their actions through that projection. Because they think that projection is God, but in reality it's just themselves. But then there are other people out there who are genuinely kind and they project that under God and they say, oh, what would God do? And they look at their projection and they say, oh, he would do that, so I will too. And I think in reality that person just genuinely good and doesn't give themselves enough credit. But it's just... I do believe people see... And it's kind of funny though actually now that I think about it a little bit more that <clears throat> Hinduism kind of has this thing that I've, I've thought of for a little bit is that um, you know a lot of people project themselves to God they see like oh whenever they're walking down the street and it's like oh that person is an a-hole god would think so too and or that person is oh that person i shouldn't be with that person that god would think so too is because they're projecting themselves to god and and so whatever they agree with basically god would agree with too even though they say oh yeah god would agree with this because i know god 
Therefore, God says not to hang out with you because you're poor or dirty or diseased or whatever. Because it's, again, they they uh, a lot, I think a lot of religious people no no not maybe not a lot but there are some religious people out there who project themselves on God or God and all they're really seeing is themselves. I mean, there are a lot of people out there like that that project themselves on God, but whether it's good or bad, that varies. And obviously, they try to teach you to be good. But, again, about the Hinduism things, the fact that, um, because in, in, I guess as far as my understanding is that in Hinduism, you are God in a sense. You are Brahman. So, you projecting this God image on, onto this plane and seeing, you're literally seeing yourself even though you see God. Makes sense in, in kind of like the Hinduism a way of uh, Advaita Vedanta, where you are God. Everyone's God in a sense. So you're just you're literally looking at yourself and agreeing with yourself on your actions. <laughs> it's a super personality. Nothing wrong. Look, we all use every ploy. And the prophet did the same. It's perfectly acceptable. We have to use this ability. Now I come to the conclusion of the Hindu religion. Despite all the gods and goddesses Despite all this idea of super personality with four arms and you know all this milder stuff, the conclusion in the religion is this: It says what you are searching for in the highest heaven, as this invisible being in an invisible plane, is not sitting there. It's here and now. Ah, well, he just said it. Hereafter, it is this spirit that you are personifying, that is lighting up every living thing, oh. sparkling in the eyes of everybody you encounter. It is the same spirit, one, shining out through so many eyes. Spirit here and now, shining out through the eyes of every living thing. The most transparent manifestation of the spirit, the clearest vision of the spirit, is humanity. Don't you see? Human beings are the most transparent manifestation of the spirit. They become very clearly visible in their eyes. Where else will you search for your God if you cannot see him or her? in the eyes of everybody you encounter, where else will you find him? This is the conclusion, despite all the gods and goddesses. This is the conclusion. The scriptures of authority, if you study the Upanishads, and maybe you will, some of you, this is the heart of the Upanishads, talking of our essential nature of the spirit. The essential of this creation is the spirit. Underpinning this world is the spirit, bubbling up through all these various forms, looking out through all these eyes, the same spirit becoming visible, becoming manifested. It is this underpinning, this spirit dimension that really is what we are searching for in the guise of a religion or a God. Seeing and serving God in humanity is the conclusion of the Hindu religion. This is called spiritual humanism. This is in stark contrast with the materialistic humanism that is very popular. <laughs> when I go to schools and colleges and say, look, if a materialist humanist tells you that, look, you are nothing but a lump of carbon that got wound up through accidents of <coughs> evolution, there's nothing more to you. Live with it. Just carbon, just lump of carbon got wound up through accidents of evolution. Do you feel comfortable? No. I mean, I, I mean, I can agree with both, actually. I mean, we are, we are carbon-based life form. That doesn't necessarily make us insignificant. I mean, it's, there's a saying, um, I forget what the saying goes, but it goes something along these lines. Um, statistic means nothing but to the individual. It means a lot. Something along those lines. Like, uh, oh, like, uh, if, there's a, if there's a million people die, it's a statistic. If one person dies, it's a tragedy. It's really weird. But, but, where was I going with that one? <laughs> But anyways, it's just it's just really weird that how we if a million people die, it's a, a statistic. But yet, when one person is a tragedy, and even though we are insignificant in this world, like we are like super tiny relative to the galaxy, and there could be many species alive out there, many different aliens. Just because we're but one tiny speck doesn't mean that our lives are insignificant to us, at least. To maybe someone else, sure, but that doesn't matter. What matters is what you think to yourself. That's what should matter. But, of course, you 
don't want to be rude or mean or whatever, do realize the world. Be kind when you can. You should be kind. Try. <laughs> should be kind. Try not to be mean. Just generalizing. Realize the world. Realize reality. Understand reality. And try to live it. And what I mean by that is, of course, don't go around disrespecting people, especially if they don't deserve it. Um, I mean, if there's someone out there who's mean or terrible to you, don't necessarily be mean back. Just try to avoid them. That's that's my that's my life in a way. I don't try to make their life a living hell for being mean or cruel. I just try to avoid them and do my job if I have to, <laughs> and then treat everyone. I, I do. I, I want. I want to do my own philosophy. Uh, just small bits and pieces that I live by. So there's a, a general level of respect that you should treat everyone. That's a, like a baseline that you start off with, and then from there, you know, just accordingly. <laughs> so again, no matter like even if he what he's saying about you're just carbon based life form um, accidentally happened in this universe. Well, good lord, you know, we're if we're an accident, we're one one fantastic accident. You know, we were successful of an accident. You know, the dinosaurs didn't quite make it. Some of them did, but. That doesn't mean that you're insignificant to yourself. To maybe other, like I said, maybe to other people you are, maybe to the universe you are, but it's irrelevant. What matters is what it means to you, and what you do with that life. There's much more to me than just a matter, just some carbon that got wound up. There's more to me. Surely there is more to me. I said that's precisely what I'm saying. The thing that's, that's winding up this matter is essentially non matter. It is not an epiphenomena of matter. It's a spirit, my boy. That is your essential nature. The reason why humanity is important, not because it, in a way, reflects this marvelous accident of evolution, because something was trying to express itself using these forms. Spirit. This is called spiritual humanism in contrast to materialistic humanism. And whenever I present these ideas at some of the very famous venues, like, say, I'm the Hindu tutor at Eton College, and I do assembly on spiritual humanism, the applause I'm generating from these atheists and agnostics <laughs> is far more than I can get it from the Hindu crowds. They love the idea. They immediately grasp the idea. Because intuitively, intuitively, they know this is the right direction. Humanism is right, but qualified with the word spiritual. Not the stodgy <coughs> materialistic humanism, spiritual human. It appeals to them. I told you, we need two things to relate to that the spirit, the heart and the head. And this is the heart. We know intuitively there's much more to us, much more to this reality than meets the eye. This is the conclusion of the Hindu tradition. Now you see, the reason why this is such an important idea is this. It's now telling us that you can make spiritual progress using any of the religious pathways you choose that appeals to you. You may say Buddhist, you can say you know, Jainism or Hinduism or Christianity, all valid pathways. If it appeals to you, go for it, my friend. Don't change your direction because your neighbor is using a different direction. Use your own direction, follow it to its destination. At the same time, it gives freedom to explore the idea of the spirit, even in a non-religious guise. This is the vastness of this idea. It says you can be spiritual using a religious prescription. If it appeals to you, go for it. It suits your temperament, go for it. You may become spiritual without a reference to a religion. This is a frightening idea. People go, dear, this is too much. If you like music or art or poetry or literature, do you know why you like it? I tell the youngsters. Through that enterprise, remember, it's always a disciplined enterprise. It is not airy-fairy and taking drugs or stuff. You become disciplined at one point and through every enterprise, enduring human enterprise that is going to focus you, whether it's music and art or literature or poetry or science itself, Providing you become one point in the focus and look, you know, take this this particular enterprise to its conclusion, you'll hit the spirit. Nothing else. The underpinning is spirit. You'll come across the spirit. That's why you love music. Because through that enterprise, you get a thrill. You don't know where the thrill comes from. I don't know why I love it. I love it. Because you're touching base with your essential being as a spirit. That's where it flows from. That's so weird. The, the, word he, the way he uses spirit is just so broad. <clears throat> I mean, again... Um, I guess that's coming from a, a Western idea of what spirit is. I, I know he talked about the spirit uh, with um, 
I got I forget I forget what the guy's name the British guy <laughs> the famous scientist guy um, about how he kept repeating spirit spirit to him and uh, he got it he understood it but it's just that you know it's confusing and even now even when I have a still understanding to it it's just it's just so I guess the definition of the spirit is so broad there has to be a better word for that and I'm trying to I'm trying to think of the definition of spirit, but it, uh, uh, for how it's explaining it. Well, so basically, whenever he, oh, that the other video that he was in when he's talking to that I can't remember the British guy's name. He's a famous scientist. And I can't remember. I'm drawing a blank. He talks about how the rock has a spirit, uh, and how he how he explained that. Um, well, I guess I could uh, do th so. This was plastic, just not not any type of plastic. This was just like big old blob of plastic, and a big old blob of plastic had this spirit in it. So basically, it took a human and the plastic to make this this, and that's the spirit behind it. Basically, um, in, the, in a statue, basically where the human and the rock, he carved up the 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 rock into a statue. That's this that that spirit was there the entire time the plastic and the human this pen was in that formation the entire time so basically this the this, this spirit we was talking about back then was how the, I guess the potential of things that might be the best way to explain it actually it's the potential of things I think that that might be a good way to put what he's trying to say about spirit because because of because of uh, again, let's go with that example. He's talking about the the musician who who didn't know. Well, he wasn't a musician. He was just a college student, I guess, that started to go play music, and then he really enjoyed it. <clears throat> that opportunity was in him this entire time. He just really focused on it and really enjoyed it. He just came to realization of what he really liked. So all of us has opportunity in us. Uh, whatever it is that we enjoy it's just until we come to our realization of that that we finally know it and then we can explore it so a person who loves playing music maybe didn't know they liked playing music two years ago and and just now discovered it that spirit or opportunity opportunity yes opportunity was there to develop for them to get good at music and for them to enjoy music maybe someone who likes making film that opportunity or spirit was there that might be a good word spirit is a bit confusing to westerners i'm sure and maybe saying spirit slash opportunity that desire that um thing that you like i guess there is not really one word to put to translate it and Spirit still, I don't think it's a very good word, but after hearing a lot, what he says is basically opportunity, desire, drive, um, and in a sense, what you enjoy. That's a good word too. And the reason why I say opportunity is because of the the the, the rock and the statue. That statue could have been any rock, but that particular rock was chosen. So the opportunity for that rock to be a statue was really high when it was chosen to be a statue as opposed to the rock right next to it which could have been just thrown in the water while it had an opportunity to become a, a, a statue but it didn't the other rock had a higher opportunity because it was chosen that's decent I don't know if that still fully explains it but that's a good decent explanation I think that's why you get a thrill go for it this gives permission for make people to make spiritual progress without a reference to a religion and still feel comfortable, not at odds with the rest of humanity. When I present this idea and I say, look, through science, suppose you like physics or you like maths, go and go to the heart of the matter, understand it in depth. If it doesn't touch you, come and tell me that the whole thing, your, 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 your proposal is nonsense. You will, you will be hit. It will touch you. It will really make you jump up and say, ah, got it. 
This is the whole aim. Becoming disciplined at one point in any field will lead you to the same destination. Because that is the underpinning to this reality. It cannot be avoided. The spirit. Now let me just lighten up again in storytelling. Same old story. Sorry about that. So yeah, it seems like that opportunity or desire, maybe not desire in a bad sense, but more along the lines of something that you enjoy. Opportunity and enjoyment. There's many opportunities in life, but generally speaking, there's very few of those opportunities that you enjoy, and those are the ones that you generally pursue. Now you see, when you say you are essential to the spirit, the spark of the divine, this is the conclusion in the religion. What you are searching for is your essential nature. Mm. Sometimes people say, Jay, look, so far we have played ball with you, and you are a lovely chap and all that, with colorful clothes and all that, but <laughs> this is blasphemy, Jay. This is blasphemy. You can't equate us. This is too much. <coughs> we do a story. I used it many a times, and it's very powerful. I can't change. It. I get a better story. A young boy comes to the Hinduism class. <coughs> you know, that boys are the best cheeky chaps to investigate religion. Came to the Hinduism class. He was told, "My boy, like it or not, believe it or not, you are the spirit. You are that what you are searching for in the heaven. It is your essential nature, my boy." The little chap was taken aback. He said, "Ah." Oh, I should have joined these classes much earlier. <laughs> I thought I'm just a goody goody, he's telling me I'm God. Yeah. Things are improving for me dramatically here. <laughs> he went in an arrogant mood, he said, Good stuff here. Went home, went to the kitchen, but the Hindu mommy is cooking as, as usual. Opened the cupboard, took out the most expensive piece of crockery reserved for the special visitor. Waved it in front of his mommy, he said, Mommy, watch. And deliberately dropped it. The plate fell on the floor, broke into a thousand pieces. I remember, I think I recognize this story. He realized that his mom was God too. <laughs> mommy, Hindu mommy, normally brown in color, turned pink. <laughs> <laughs> then she turned red. <laughs> then she lifted her arm and came near the boy. And the boy, in his arrogant mood, pulled his hand out of his pocket. Said, stop, mommy, stop. <laughs> mommy, said the boy. Do you know who I am? <laughs> <laughs> Mommy was like, this cheeky fellow comes, breaks place, like, who am I? She said, who are you? Mommy, said the boy, like it or not, believe it or not, I am God. <laughs> now, fortunately, Mommy had been to the Hinduism class too. <laughs> he said, my boy, my second question to is, who am I? The boy had learned these lines well. He said, Mommy, like it or not, believe it or not, you too are God. Mommy said, we are making progress. <laughs> <laughs> you are baby God, I am Mommy God. <laughs> <laughs> There's a third lesson in Hinduism that you're not attended. We say that whenever baby God goes around the house breaking plates deliberately, <laughs> Mommy God has to do a worship ceremony of the baby God. And the boy was getting worried. He said, what worship? <laughs> She has to bring the baby goat near, turn him round, and smack his bottom. <laughs> and she mustn't leave a mark, otherwise social service goat will come. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I use this story in so many places. I I do that just because that's the quirk that he has that I, I, I truly enjoy. I love like the day that he stops doing that. I'm gonna be like, oh, something's wrong. I, I don't know. I just I just find it so funny. That's the thing that he does. That I just I always see. He's just I don't know why he doesn't just keep it on there. But he always has a like a few of times where he would put it on, then take it right off. I'm like, <laughs> just keep it off or put it on, man. You're gonna poke yourself in the eye or something. You're gonna break your glasses. <laughs> I wonder if he he's done that if already. I can't find the better ones. I'm repeating it. But it's a very powerful story. It is telling us that it's not an arrogant comment to say, I am the spirit. It's not arrogance. In fact, it's the most <coughs> ego-destroying comment you can ever pass. Because that's not that you are special. Everything you look at is special. Everywhere is special. And the terms of engagement still stay. Mommy will smack a little chap even if he misbehaves gently. <laughs> but the terms of engagement stay, and yet you spiritualize everybody. So it's not an arrogant comment. You know the ego central. In fact, it's the most ego-destroying comment. Because now I'm no longer here. I'm reflected everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know how powerful this idea is? That, uh... I don't know. My, my view on that is the fact that if everything is this, then, then yeah, it's not necessarily to say arrogance, but that's not to say that you're special either. 
because um, how do I say like every human being in a sense has a brain I mean I'm, maybe there are some that don't I don't know I don't think so but every human being has a brain so saying that we all have brains doesn't make me special but again I guess that goes to the ego the fact that saying oh I have a brain therefore I'm special is kind of egotistical but everyone has a brain so and you don't you should not see yourself as special that way you shouldn't see yourself as special just because you have something it's what you do with what you have that can make you special I think so I guess that goes along the lines of what it's saying because everyone is God therefore you know it's not egotistical because everyone's God therefore you, you must in a sense humble yourself because you are not the God but you are part of everyone that is the a God or the God or gods this forms the foundation of ethics and morality it says this it says do you know why you don't hurt somebody because essentially the same thing is percolating through these eyes is percolating through those eyes spirit is always singular the same thing is shining out here shining out there so if I hurt him, I'm actually hurting myself. And suppose you lift somebody up, don't even call it charity. <laughs> it's a demeaning comment. You help yourself. What's the big deal? You see... I do believe in that. I mean, I don't necessarily call things charity either. I mean, I, helping people is just helping people, you know. Doing just again, just a little bit of good. You don't have to do anything special or financial to do something good. Merely hoping, opening a door for someone, holding a door for someone, or just pick, helping someone pick up some things. You know, that's just little bits of things like that actually makes a a day a lot better for yourself and for that person. I'm sure. You will find this whenever you find a philanthropic person. If you tell him why are you doing it, it's because you want to go to your, get your picture in the newspaper. He said, No, I can't help myself. I just feel like doing it. This is the sign of genuine charity, genuine like philanthropy. It sounds like his voice is getting lower. I'm having a hard time hearing him. Idea. You see yourself reflect. You have no choice. When you see a problem in front of your eyes, you must do something about it. You just can't help yourself. And do you know which nation is perhaps gets the highest mark in the world today? Not India. Despite appearances, let me be very blunt. Hindus are very good in theory. They are horrible in practice. Wait, what? Yeah, day before, yesterday, no, day before I was doing a session in talk. Back, Hindus are very good in theory. Do something about it. You just can't help yourself. And do you know which nation is perhaps gets the highest mark in the world today? Not India. Despite appearances, let me be very blunt. Hindus are very good in theory. They are horrible in practice. <laughs> In fact, yeah, if day before, yesterday, no, day before I was doing a session in Totnes where some young ladies came and said, we want to go to the Himalayas to get the spirit. I said, look, ladies, I'm telling you, if you go to the Himalayas, you get diarrhea, diarrhea. <laughs> <laughs> Stay here, go to your bedroom, sit cross-legged on your bed, and search for the spirit. It's there already. You don't need to go to some caves. It's here, don't you see? Look, I'm telling you very blatantly, and I'm very comfortable to say that. Hindus are very good theoreticians, extremely good theoreticians, extremely poor practitioners, very poor. If you go to modern India, it will make you shudder, look, I can't go. Because this difference between the heaven and heaven notes is so vast and so frightening. It's, it's not, uh, not human, it's not civilized. So I tell the Hindus, I wave my finger and tell them, you lost your religion a long time ago. Your religion is called Bollywood, Bollywood, Bollywood. <laughs> dancing naked girls, that's all you know. You lost your, 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 you know, you lost the love of religion. If you see a problem in front of your eyes and you can't resolve it, you lost the plot. Here is your living God. You can't serve him here. Where else will you serve him? And you want to go and tinkle bells in the temple? Good luck to you. You see, this is honesty. The best place where I find this idea of being practiced in the name of a mature democracy, in the name of secularism, this idea of seeing is dignifying humanity. The best place where I see this idea being put into practice is not India. Here, here. I cannot, I can, I just have to take my hat off and say, look, what you've been bragging about and preaching, you're putting into practice without the tops and the tails. See? If it's a disabled person in some of these nations, they'll hide him as a blemish to the family. Mm -hmm. Here. 
they buy me a little scooter <laughs> and he overtakes everybody else. <laughs> this is the conclusion, not of a theory, but a practice of spiritual humanism, dignifying humanity. What else, what else can you do? If religion is just learning books and you know, memor memorizing verses or tinkling bells, God forbid. It is to interact with the greater society. See, you're living God here. <coughs> Let me just crack a bit of humor. You know, I go to a lot of schools and little children always catch me. Mr. Lakhani, because you've got so many gods in Hinduism, which god do you believe in? <laughs> I'm very naughty. I look the child in the eye and say, my boy, the god that I believe in is looking at me through those eyes now. We go, oh! <laughs> <laughs> This is actually, as I said, the conclusion of the Hindu tradition. Okay, okay. <laughs> hmm. Is that true what he's saying about Hindus are good, um, not practitioner, but a uh, theoretician? I can't remember the way he said. <laughs> but bad, terrible practitioners? You see, this is honesty. The best place where I find, so I tell the Hindus, I wave my finger and tell them, you lost your religion a long time ago. I said, look, ladies, I'm telling you, if you go to the Himalayas, you get diarrhea, diarrhea. <laughs> so, I mean, we're just talking about the Bollywood stuff. I mean, some people find that is their passion, that's their spirit. So, I do wonder if I, I go talk to him and say, hey, look, you know, the people in Bollywood, I mean, what if that is their spirit, though? What, the, what they're pursuing is their spirit. I mean, of course, again, pursuing it to become rich is not necessarily wrong. It's how you act, though, how you handle yourself around people. So um, you could very well be very rich and you could be very generous and humble or just humble in general and kind, which again, nothing wrong. But if you're you're an a-hole, treat people like trash, it doesn't matter where you're rich or poor, you're still that, you are a trash person. So being rich or poor doesn't, doesn't how to say, make you a good or a bad person. It's you yourself, whether you're rich or poor, however... However, <laughs> this is something I've learned when I just so happened to be watching um, videos about uh, millionaires, basically. Uh, uh, not millionaires, sorry. People who hit the lottery. And this is something that a few of my friends said, and I, I do believe it to be true. All money does to a person is exaggerate who they are as a person. So if if you're poor and you and you become a millionaire and you became poor again, it's only because when you were poor you couldn't m manage your money. You're spending it all the time. Then when you finally got a lot of money, you just end up exaggerating that feature. That feature, <laughs> you exaggerate that. Your I guess that feature of yourself, even worse because you have more money now. Because there are a lot of I don't know how much, but it's really strange. I watch a video on YouTube <laughs> that there are uh, jackpot winners who won like $200 million, more money than they ever won in their lifetime. They could ever earn in their lifetime, and they regretted it. They become poor, broke, and don't know what to do. And so it's like broke in six months. Like, how in the world do you do that? I wouldn't. I guess I wouldn't know because uh, until I win the jack the, the the lottery, I guess I won't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm pretty cheap myself, so I'll probably be even cheaper. Exaggerate this. Like, oh, I used to buy $1 burgers. Now it's 50 cents. That, now that I have $2 million or a million dollars or whatever, now I buy 50 cent burgers instead of dollar burgers. <laughs> Exaggerate the cheapness. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, and I do believe that, you know, give, if someone all of a sudden acquired a lot of money, it I, I do believe, not necessarily to everyone, but it exaggerates certain aspects of them. Some people are generous and they end up giving a lot of money away. Uh, some people are kind and, you know, they keep to themselves. They don't really spend a lot of money and they don't exactly give money away. They retain the money. I mean, and they just, how do you exaggerate normancy? Like live a humble life and don't necessarily spend a lot of money. You can exaggerate that. And then you have people out there who just can't control their spending habits. Oof. Anyways, that's my reaction to how to be spiritual, Jay Lakhani. If you like my content, please consider subscribing. Thumbs up, thumbs down down below. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next vid.